Hey, everybody, we're going to look at the next chapter. Hey, everybody, we're going to look at the next chapter of the Vietnam War here. And look also at the counterculture as part of our, our notes. There'll be one more after this to do. It'll probably be your last ones for the year, ladies and gentlemen, that you don't have to worry about. Um, so up until 1967, we've gotten so far, the war is a stalemate. That means that no side could really say they're winning. Remember, the only way that we were really measuring victory here was by number of deaths. Okay, there's no land, no leaders, that kind of thing. I mean, in the public, we said we were winning. When we look at it, you know, people are kind of questioning winning, not winning. Up until 1968 and an event called Tet. Now, Tet is the Vietnamese New Year. And one of the things that happened here was a truce, okay, a ceasefire was called for Tet. On Tet, um, when this event happened, all of a sudden people started coming into all the, in the Vietnamese cities. And the, the people moving in in their civilian clothing was actually a Viet Cong attack. Using that Ho Chi Minh Trail that runs outside of Vietnam. The Viet Cong made a coordinated attack on every single U on every single city in South Vietnam at once. Twenty five different cities were talking. It was an attack on, and because it was so widespread, it was so hard to tell who was who. It was hard for the United States to respond to the attack. Um, in fact, even the Viet Cong took over the U.S. Embassy in Saigon, the South Vietnamese capital. This was supposed to be the safest zone in all of Vietnam, and it was still taken over. Now, eventually, over time, the U.S. fights back, but. It was uh, not a military victory, but a moral defeat, we call it, okay? As people saw the events that's happening in, in Life magazine, live on TV, all that kind of stuff, you can see the pictures here, public started turning against the war. Now, the Ho Chi Minh Trail that made this happen, each little dot here is an attack that happened on Tet, and the trail ran out alongside, outside of Vietnam here, all those little maze of muddy roads that you see in the picture here that allowed the Viet Cong to move. And remember, the U.S. could not attack this trail because it was outside of Vietnam. And that allowed the attack into into Vietnam from uh, that trail. Now, in 1968, as this Tet Offensive is going on, President Johnson says, you know what, I can't run this anymore, okay? I'm not going to run for re-election because the war is just too much. And Johnson decided not to run because the, the war is just, just getting too bad. The Democrats, they make a decision. Hubert H. Humphrey uh, from Minnesota and Robert F., also as Bobby Kennedy, the little brother of John F. Kennedy. Well, they're, these two are debating uh, back and forth. Uh, Kennedy is assassinated, as seen right here, by the name Sirhan Sirhan in California while campaigning. He was coming through the kitchen and was assassinated. Now, um, as Democrats trying to figure out what to do, there was a huge riot that broke out at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago. All these protesters that were there protesting the war um, were gassed or clubbed. Huge problems happening. A guy named Richard Nixon runs uh, for the Republicans and is elected. We've seen Richard Nixon before coming. He ran against Kennedy in 1960. He was also the vice president for Ike in the 50s. And he ran a platform. His big idea was we're going to end Vietnam with honor and also help support civil rights in America. That's what he said he was going to run on. Now, I said the media was playing a huge, war this, a huge role at this time in the, in, in the Vietnam War. Remember, this is the first ever televised war that's going on. Every single thing is being seen live uh, on TV Every single night. And much like the Iraq War, seeing that every single night on the news really changed how, how the public felt about the war. Um, every single night, there are body and casualty counts, interviews from soldiers as they're fighting on the battlefield we're talking, okay? Now, one of the most famous news reporters in the country, a guy named Walter Conkright, went to the, went to the uh, Vietnam during Tet, and he said, you know what? He said, we are not winning. Um, images that were seen that were happening here really did kind of start turning the public against the war. It caused what was called the credibility gap. You see it right here. Yeah, the U.S. had promised a quick, easy victory. The media showed a very different story. As the years dragged on, people weren't sure if we were winning or not. They weren't sure to believe the United States. They weren't sure what people were fighting for. And a lot of people started questioning the war because of that. And the bigger question was, what would victory in Vietnam actually be? And so people started asking that question. Why are we in the war? Okay. President Johnson, before he leaves, is asking the exact same question, okay? And one of the famous Johnson's quotes is, I can't get out, I can't finish what I've got, what the hell do I do? And that's one of the reasons that President Johnson decides not to run for president again in 1968. And so protests really start over the war and over the draft. Guys who are um, looking to uh, have their draft cards, they start burning their draft cards. So they say, if there's no card, you cannot be drafted. Now, part of the reason that you burn the draft card, too, is that... Uh, destroying your draft card is a federal offense, heads to prison. And so one of the big protests was burning your draft card to stop that. All those people left to Canada. They just left the country, went to Canada and said, I'm in Canada, you can't get me now. Um, there were a lot of violence in protests that happened. So in 1968 in Chicago, violence over, over the over the war um, erupted at the Democratic Convention where people were being clubbed and 
those kind of things. In medicine, uh, Dow Chemical was a com- company that was making the napalm and the Agent Orange that was being used in, in Vietnam. And they were recruiting students uh, for jobs at UW-Madison. And a big riot happened outside on the campus there through our protests in the war. The base one by far was in Kent State, Ohio, 1970. Um, in Kent State, we're put up here a picture you see right here. There are protesters outside, and they brought the National Guard in to keep the protesters back. All of a sudden, when the National, the National Guard members fires their gun, and shots are being fired into the crowd at Kent State, and four students die. Uh, there's, also, there's also happened down Mississippi and other universities as well where these riots were taking place. Um, one thing really close to home here was the 1970s. In 1970 was a Sterling, How- Sterling Hall bombing on, on UW campus. Uh, the four guys here called the New Year's Gang, uh, set a, a big a, a van full of a, a, a fertilizer bomb outside the Sterling Hall, which at the time was, how it was called the Army Math Center. They're using that center to design missiles and rockets and bombs, those kind of things. And they, they called the police, said, get everybody out. The bombs are happening at 3 o'clock in the morning. Then a few minutes later, the van went off. There was one researcher working late at night who was killed. But this kind of says, strikes us uh, you know, strikes us pretty close to home here as we were protesting. One of the protests they tried to do, they tried dropping homemade, small homemade bombs on top of Badger ammo from uh, a small one, in, a small single engine plane. Luckily, the bombs didn't go off. Uh, the Badger Powder Works, just a little, a little north of us here, that was actually being used to uh, create a lot of the gunpowder and rocket fuel. Those kind of things used to some of the we- some weapons in Vietnam. The other thing they also supposed to try to do is also supposed to try to blow up the Prairie du Sac Dam because the dam provides electricity for Badger. And so, kind of see this protest thing was very close to home here in some cases. A lot of protests were very, very peaceful. People marching, people chanting, those kind of things. But a few times it got out of control. Um, by the way, the three bombers were eventually arrested up in Canada. One guy has yet to be captured. Martin Luther King Jr., before he was assassinated in 1968, gets involved in the protests as well. He said a lot of the black deaths in Vietnam were what we were arguing against. Uh, one-tenth, 10% of all soldiers in Vietnam were black, but yet black soldiers account for 20% of all casualties, you know. And that was kind of one of the big things that King brought up was, you know, why are African-American soldiers on the front lines so much? You know, and a lot of times draftees were put in the infantry, which meant they were on the front lines, being on the front, being shot at. And a lot of these questions he started putting out there, why are we fighting in so many civil war? This is between North and South Vietnam. Why are we involved? Obviously, it goes back to the whole communism issue, but that's that. Why are we fighting a war we cannot win? You know, you know, government people have said it's a, not a regular war. It's a totally different kind of war. You know, why, why are we why, why are you fighting a war that we can't win? And lastly, why are we supporting a corrupt government? That guy, DM, he was a corrupt leader. And so people have said, you know, why are we supporting a guy who's not who's a dictator, who we, don't, who we don't like? And it was kind of when the protests came on that way. Now, flipping up to another movement that happens in the 60s is a counterculture movement. In other words, the hippie movement. Everybody has to talk about this. Everybody has to look at this one. Think about the values of the 50s, early 60s. Consumerism, buying stuff, materialism, things mean a lot. Being very conservative, the idea of morals, you know, racism still being present. You know, the Cold War happened, a chance of things blowing up with, you know, uh, you know, Korea and Vietnam and the Cuban Missile Crisis, that threat of nuclear war. That's what a lot of people are growing up in, okay, at early on here. And people start going against those values. See, the counterculture went against those values, okay? It's up to who made those values. It's those, their parents made those values. The ones that were born in the 30s and 40s, uh, you know, they, they made those values, okay? And they said, we're going to go against that. We're going to be different. Um, this really starts in the 50s with the beat movement. There were writers who said, do your own thing, go your own way, uh, go against, you know, kind of what was expected of people. You know, and the counterculture were kids who grew up in the 50s, okay? So they were, you know, young kids in the 50s, you know, they were born, you know, in the late 40s, early 50s, uh, that new current baby boomer generation, my parents' generation, they grew up in that culture of, you know, Korea and nuclear war, those kind of things. They said, we're going to blame old people for creating all the problems. We call them the establishment. Anybody over 30 that was old, by the way, which is me now, I guess. Um, but said that, you know, old people created the problems. It was the establishment. And we want to go against the establishment because, you know, they're the ones that created all these problems in this world. Now, the big belief of the hippies was to do your own thing, all right? Uh, you don't worry about what other people want you to do. You do what you want to do, okay? And you share what you have with others. It's kind of Marxist in a way, kind of communist in a way, but you share what you got, okay? If you have food, lodging, whatever, you share it. And he basically said not to worry about science so much. So much was put on logic and science and do the right thing, get the right job, live the right life, have the right house, all that kind of stuff. They said, screw that. Go with your feelings, all right? 
what makes you happy, what makes you want to do what's right. You know, a lot of things tend to came from highs. You know, the idea of free love, sex, drugs, those kind of things comes into it. And um, one of the things that, that the mo movement did was kind of separate the idea of sex from love. It didn't have to be that. Um, it was, you know, it wasn't about a marriage kind of thing. It was about the happiness kind of thing. You know, the pill did play a role in that. No pregnancy uh, from, you know, uh, from sexual activity, but still STDs did come and play a role in this whole thing, especially the, the free love movement and who you uh, do that kind of stuff with. Drugs play a little role as well here, especially hallucinogens. That would kind of make the mind hallucinate a little bit. Um, LSD, uh, acid, also known as, and marijuana being part of that. And a lot of people said it would expand the mind, okay, and make you think outside the, the normal ways of doing this. And a big advocate of this was a guy named Timothy Leary. Timothy Leary was a Harvard college professor, okay, who was a very, very big drug advocate. He encouraged people, especially his students, to, I quote, turn on, tune in, drop out. Um, basically, use the drugs, acid, LSD, marijuana kind of stuff to expand your mind, just kind of tune to that, drop out of school, and do your, kind of go your own path. Um, you have to start seeing LSD uh, go down because of what we call bad trips. I mean, LSD is a, is a drug that actually changes your brain chemistry. And I'll tell you some stories about um, some of my high school teachers, actually, uh, that had bad trips, and actually it sticks with you forever. Um, you know, my high school teachers, uh, when I was in school, you know, talked about having acid flashbacks. And when you did this stuff, it did change your brain chemistry. It did change you forever. Um, and some people had really bad experience with some of the drugs. Um, you know, and they kind of advocated for their youth saying, you know, think about our parents' generation. They drank. Right? Our parents' generation drank their martini every night. That are using marijuana, other drugs. It's kind of like that um, in terms of how they believe that, why they're using their drugs. Uh, also spawns new ways of going against materialism. Um, they base a lot of things off Eastern religions like Buddhism and Hinduism, which are very pacifist, not hurting other people. They share a lot of materials that way. Um, you have a lot of these kind of group and groups that kind of come out of that. And, and at the time, it looked very, very weird because you had to think about a very conservative Christian culture we had and going very different, you know, wearing different clothing, uh, kind of looking at ourselves on, on Eastern religion where you shared a lot of things. Uh, Moonies, the Hare Krishna sect, we kind of shared a lot of different, you kind of shared everything, these little groups, um, and kind of got together and kind of shared experiences. It was very, very different and very, very controversial at the time. Uh, and so it's about sharing together is that people live together in big uh, areas. Uh, the two really big urban hippie areas were High Ashbury neighborhood in San Francisco, the East Village in New York. So we saw these big kind of urban areas where people had uh, pads above shops to crash. I mean, people didn't pay for rent. They just kind of crashed wherever they could. Uh, they played street shows, pay, uh, you know, played music for money, whatever they could get. There was free shops where you could get clothing, get food, that kind of stuff. Everyone shared everything in these areas. As well as big movements of, you know, of going against that material culture. In rural areas, they had communes. And so it was like a big farm where people lived together. They shared all the work equally, shared the food. They didn't have an order. They can't avoid planning. What was really funny about the commune community is that the gender roles ended up still applying. So men still did most of the men job, quote unquote, women still did most of the women's job, quote unquote. But these communes are supposed to live together, work together. No one had no one's a boss, no one's in charge. They all kind of work equally. You start seeing a lot of these hippie ideas come into mainstream culture. I mean, not a lot a lot of people weren't all complete hippies and kind of totally bought into the movement. A lot of people you know, they call it cultural diffusion, where they kind of brought different hippie ideas into the mainstream culture. Things like organic and vegetarian diets came as part of this, where, you know, from the Eastern religions, like Buddhism, that believes in, uh, and Hinduism, that, that don't believe in eating meat, in some cases, they kind of brought that movement in um, and kind of becomes part of mainstream culture. Clothing. You start seeing a lot of different clothing materials coming together, like Native American clothing, Eastern patterns, tie-dye, beads, the idea of wearing your hair long, being different, that way is very different. It's very, very, very kind of comes into mainstream culture. Reusing clothes, the idea of patching your clothes. If you, you know, tore a pair of jeans, you would throw it away. Here they put patches on and those kind of, well, I guess today you wear it because it looks cool, but whatever. Um, but back then you would patch your clothes and, you know, reuse different things and that kind of stuff as a way to uh, kind of, you know, uh, participate in that part of the culture. Pop art's last we're talking about in this section of the video. Make sure you check out part two as we last little bit of it, but Pop culture actually made, made fun of mainstream culture. Uh, Andy Warhol painted everyday things. The most famous painting be a, a can of tomato, Campbell's tomato soup. You know, saying, hey, this is art. Look at it. It's regular, but yet it's art. He painted, you know, different uh, pictures. We'll look at some of the images in class. Uh, Klaus Oldenburg, he made sculptures of everyday things. He made sculptures of a spoon, sculpture of a fork. 
that kind of stuff to kind of make fun of the idea of art and how it's supposed to be fancy, that kind of stuff. Check out part two, guys.